and just like magic. Voila. Okay. You can go on. Well, since it's Martin Luther King Day, um, I grew up in Montana, and at that time, you know, we didn't travel like you do now. So, 45 miles was a long ways to go. Um, but I did uh, get engaged to an airman that was living down at uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. So when I got on the train um, out of Missoula, it was very strange. I just couldn't quite figure it out because, you know, there would be a bunch of white people and then there would be a, a car with maybe one black person or so on. I knew nothing about it, so I just sat where I wanted to sit, you know. And uh, nobody said anything to me. But when I got down to Mississippi, um, it was Keesler Air Force Base and Biloxi, Mississippi was there. Um, I really learned a lot about segregation, which I didn't know anything. I was a very immature 20-year-old, you might say. Um, but there were posters up. You know, say for instance, somebody would be performing at one of these really beautiful hotels that was right on the beach, but the poster would cover up any black person that was performing. And the school that I taught in was a Catholic school, um, and I was a lay teacher, and I noticed that, you know, the, the only time you saw a black person was serving serving the food and you know I just just started to learn about the fact that there was such a thing as segregation I knew nothing about this but um, that's why I kind of like to start with that story on Martin Luther King Day because it is a day that is really significant and our country, unfortunately, has gone backwards when it comes to integration and all people being equal and justice for all is a, is a tough thing to find. So that was, <laughs> that was what I wanted to mention about that. We are next. What would you like to hear? Um, so our first question is usually, what is your name and your age and where are you from? Okay, where I started from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like where you were born. born. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My name is Dorothy Gale Rainey, and I was named after the youngest aunt on my mother's side and the youngest uncle on my, the other side. So that's where the Dorothy and the Gale came from. I was born on May 22nd, 1940. And you were born in, were you born in Montana? I was. Um, I was born in Absarki, uh, Montana. I don't think you'll find it on the map anymore. I don't think it <laughs> exists anymore. <laughs> so how, why, and when did you come to Cordova? Well, I had been flying for a while quite a while, and um, I'm a very restless person, and um, I was talking to one of the other pilots uh, out of Cordoba. I was flying at Yakutat at that, time, at that time, and they said that, boy, it's a good time to go to Cordoba because there's no float planes, and I had an amphibious aircraft, so away I went, and I came to Cordova in the winter of 1979-1980. Um, so did you, what age did you get your pilot's license? I wasn't a youngster. Mm -hmm. I already had two kids. Uh, so it was in uh, 1966 is when I started to fly. And were you in Alaska then or were you? Yes, I was okay. in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So were you doing like tours or well why? you know you go through the process of getting your different licenses uh -huh. and so I started out with a flight school that I taught 
between Skagway and Haynes, and I did some flight instruction, and then I got my commercial license, and I had the opportunity to become actually one of the first female airline pilots, but I knew I'd be bored to death. That's just <laughs> not what I, I'm not a city person. I'm a country person. I love the country. That's uh, why I like Cordova. And so I passed that up. And uh, my dream was to become a bush pilot. That's what I wanted to do. Did you want to do that from a young age, or was it a... No, not really. Uh, I didn't have any dreams of becoming a pilot. I mean, I know lots of young people that live up here. Actually, that's their dream, because they're raised with it. But I was the first one in my family to become a pilot, and uh, that's just where I started. <laughs> I was about 26 years old, 26 years old when I started flying. Um, so how many were in your family growing up? You mean my siblings? Yeah, like how many siblings? Um, there were five of us, and um, four of them still talk to me. Just, <laughs> just one doesn't. So. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, um, even our family did not um, get away with some problems with drug addiction and alcoholism. My twin brothers both had uh, fought that their entire life. So that's, uh, you, you know, you'd think you'd, at that age, you know, you'd miss out on it, but it was not to be. Um, so, I already know the answer to this. Um, is any of your family in Cordova? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Thank heavens. I and mean, that's why I'm here. I would not be in Cordova or any place if I didn't have family. I mean, family is it, isn't it? You know, yeah. flying family. <laughs> uh, but my son... Steve, whom you know, and now Chris and Carl, the twins are both here, and uh, so and Wendy is my daughter-in-law, um, so that's wonderful. But if they leave, I'm out of here. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place in Cordova, or like maybe a little bit out of Cordova, that you like to go to? Secret mm. bush location that we can't get to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an awful lot of places that I like to go to. Go to but I'm not flying now, so I don't have to go there. But I, I couldn't name one. There's just so many beautiful places. What are places. some of them? What are some of them? Yeah. Oh, of course. Um, I like um, uh, down by Cape St. Elias. That's beautiful. The sea lions are there, and, mm -hmm. and the Cape itself, and it's it's some it, it's a spot that's different from anything else. The mm -hmm. the steepness of the ridges, you know, and and uh, I remember taking a group kids out and they had not really learned about hypothermia or anything. And there they were in their, you know, light jackets and and uh, standing out, you know, not huddling or doing anything. And that's one of the things you learn to do in the cold is huddle, isn't it? You know, you get together and you <laughs> yeah. literally huddle. And there they were just cold, miserable. And uh, um, it was raining and snowing, and I was having to clean off the wings of the cub as best I could, and Steve was flying too, and so we got the kids to a warmer spot so he could start taking the kids into town. And, uh, Is that Adam Lau's group? <laughs> <laughs> 
in yeah, our school I was I was quite <laughs> shocked that nobody had taught the, these kids about when you should learn oh, that yeah. too about dressing for the weather and you have to think of the worst possible scenario, not the not the best. Yeah. And that's what you dress for. Because you can always take clothes off. But if you don't have clothes to put on, you're you're stuck. <laughs> well especially a place like that, it's not like you're gonna whip right home. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And there's lots of places in Alaska that are are like that. Um, so have you traveled like other places in the world outside of the United States? Uh, you know, I, I really wanted to travel a lot more than I got to, but um, I did take one journey by myself um, to New Zealand because I knew that a lot of people would speak English and that was a requirement <laughs> since I'm not good at a lot of languages. And uh, so I had rented a, a a little van before we, I got there, and they said, well, choose which one you want. And lo and behold, they had one that was Wonder, Wonder Woman. <laughs> I thought, that's exactly what I don't feel like right now, so I'm going to get in this thing. <laughs> and uh, actually, I did pretty good at driving at the wrong side of the road <laughs> until... I got to a gravel road, and I was going up a steep gravel mountain, and I thought, what the hell are those people doing on the wrong side of the road? And I thought, oh, it's me. I mean, they were so close, I could see their eyes, big and wide. Yeah, as long as you had the stripe down the road, you're doing pretty good. And I don't know if any of you have, have you're, you're what very well traveled, and I'm, I'm not. Mexico, uh, We've gone to several times, um, and uh, of course you go through Canada. That's great land too. Did you understand them when you went to the place that spoke English? Could you understand them very well? Oh yeah. Them? Oh good. Yeah, they yeah, were great. It? Yeah, okay. they were wonderful people, and, and I just really enjoyed it and uh, brought back some great souvenirs for people. John, my dear beloved John, um, didn't want to go, and he was really put out with me when I came back. <laughs> he was a bear cat. <laughs> I mean, really. It's uh, like when you leave your dog and they get really mad at you when you come yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The dog would have been nicer. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place in the world? In the world? Mm. I don't know. I just always wanted to see more. But Alaska is where I belong. I know. And I'm sure you've got to see a lot of cool places in Alaska that nobody's got to see. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Um, is there anything, if you're talking to someone who's never been to Cordova, what would you share with them about Cordova? Well, the first thing I'd tell them is to put the rain gear on and <laughs> stand in the shower. <laughs> and if you don't get real wet, then you've got good rain gear. That's good advice. I'll have to use that one. <laughs> Can you tell us about one of your most extraordinary experiences? Mm. <laughs> I know that's a hard one, but... Yeah, <laughs> it is. That is really tough. <laughs> well, um, I think this, this isn't so extraordinary in the sense of extraordinary, but I think one of the most interesting things is I'm a non-swimmer. Uh, and when they took us out on the ship, um, Coast Guard ship, and we had to jump off of it, and we were in survival suits. But then I was all over the place because 
being a non-swimmer, you know, they say, no, no, Gail, this way, this way, over this way. <laughs> and, but we finally got to uh, the shore, and then we gave our survival suits back to them, and we were to survive on what we had in our pockets. And that was pretty good, except uh, since I was the only female on the island, and they, I got stuck with two troopers, which was not exactly <laughs> what you would choose. <laughs> but that was interesting, uh, and and was a good thing in survival suit, in survival training, I should say. How long did you have to stay on that island? Just one Just night. night, but you could hear the Coast Guard guys all over. Hey, Mom, where are you? <laughs> 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 Who made you do that? Was it because you were flying for them or something? Nobody made me do it. It's just something that I thought I needed to learn. Oh, a training exercise you just volunteered for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about one of your favorite experiences? <laughs> My favorite experiences? <laughs> Besides having two sons, which was quite miraculous to me. Uh, golly. Give me some clues, Steve. Oh, how about, like, you know, when we were in Yakutat, you used to, they didn't have cell phones and stuff, so you used to always put the poster on the side of the plane that, like, oh, yeah. you know, for birth <laughs> announcements and oh, things yeah. like that. Yeah, I yeah. did. I taped it. But there were two brothers, and they were very competitive, and and the one brother had two girls already, so uh, he wanted his his brother to have a girl. But that's what I taped, duct taped on the side of my plane was, it's a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I flew down really low um, so he could read it, and I circled around and made sure that he read it, so I went back down twice and, and uh, so that was the announcement. <laughs> or, or how you guys used to do the moose closures. Oh, yeah. That was uh, fun because sometimes, um, sometimes uh, we would use a megaphone taped onto the airplane and uh, the person with me would be the biologist, and it, he would say that the, he could say over the loudspeaker that the moose closure is as of this time. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, we had one comedian who just bit. It was perfect timing. Uh, a large area of uh, Chilcat Lake was covered with fog and he went over it and he said this is God <laughs> and don't you dare shoot another moose Um, how many hours do you know how many hours you have flown? Records of that? Um, I did. I was, I was, I don't know if you can call it proud, but I guess that's what it was. I was so glad to be flying. And it was, it came out to closer to 28,000 hours, just shy of that. And it was all, that wonderful stuff where I got to go count the goats, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, you would go at different levels. This was all in the Super Cup. You'd go in on different levels, you know, and then you'd go down or up, whichever you chose. And the biologist was really good about letting you make these decisions. Because if you didn't feel comfortable or you were afraid of it, uh, or you didn't think it was right to start at the low level and work your way up. That was my choice. You know? And so we'd go into every little 
nook and cranny practically, seeing the goats, and I was counting as well as flying, and of course the biologist was flying, and at that time we didn't, now they have a GPS and they can, you know, push the button and the point will be marked on the map, and uh, that was great. And we got to see things like um, the time that we saw the wolves going up the, a, a steep slope after the mountain goats. And the mountain goats are smart enough to get out on the smallest outcrop, you know, and the, the wolves just can't get at them. And another time we saw um, there, were, there was a moose with twin calves. And there was uh, about three or four wolves around. And it, it was almost like there was a sacrificial baby. And one of the babies headed for the creek and went down the creek and didn't survive, of course. But the mother then was left with one. And so I guess it was a survival of the fittest. But I didn't quite understand how the animal brain worked at that point, <laughs> but wow. yeah, it was, it was something to see. But of course, Steve was the one that saw the goat that butted the wolf, was it? Yeah, I think, I think it was it. Yeah. yeah, tell them about that. No, they're interviewing you, not me. <laughs> well, but you can, you can <laughs> say, no, we'll say something. Well, the, the better one we saw was a... Uh, I saw a wolf and a wolverine, and I had to sit down. Oh, wow. A wolf and Yeah. They were, they were in a standoff, and we circled a while. We never did see who won the standoff. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a good matchup. Or, yeah. or didn't you see the one where the wolf went under the water and grabbed the, the geese? Oh, yeah, no, the, the geese. The, oh. the swan. Yeah. Swan's feet. Wow. Drug them under and drowned them. Yeah, you just don't see things like this if you're not out there at, at the right time. And that was one of the things that, that was a problem because, you know, the Forest Service, bless their little bureaucratic minds, uh, <laughs> felt that you should fly between 8 and 5. Well, guess what? You're not going to see anything at that time. The animals are all taking their naps. And, mm -hmm. But... Finally, we got it stretched out enough so that we could stretch it a little bit, and boy, we did see a lot more, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite things, I don't know what was you or Steve that did it, was when they were trapping so many wolves. Yeah. We flew over and dropped some fish to that one wolf that was trapped for <laughs> <laughs> we weren't supposed to do that can I ask one question yeah I was going to bring up the book okay no you can ask question. my question is Gail Rainey wrote that book Great and question. what was it like to write a book <laughs> Oh, I never dreamed that I'd write a book, and obviously I might be just a one-book person. <laughs> but uh, it was amazing. And um, we had some friends, uh, Lynn and Annette, uh, what's the last name? Wilson. Oh, Wilson, yeah. And we proofread that book over and over and over again. And I was amazed at how, you know, your eyes are, will trick you. Because if you read something, pretty soon you're anticipating what it's saying. And so we would go over and over it. And the first edition that we had printed out had a mistake on the first page of writing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we got that corrected on it for the next one and most people didn't even notice it though because once again you're anticipating what what you read but it was it was amazing and we had a lot of fun doing it and the the person that did the uh, front uh, was Herb Bonnet and he did it in black and white and fortunately uh, the printer had a girl who, a woman who specialized 
in in covers and, and things, and she put the blues in it, and I thought it was it was she did a gorgeous job. Except the plane would probably be closer to the mountains. Here. <laughs> <laughs> did you write the story stories as you lived life and? Go back and I compile. Kept a, I kept a journal. Compile them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of the writing was done over the years. Yeah. I, I kept a journal, and uh, I, how, how, do you keep journals? When I travel. Okay. But not like every day. Not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think mostly journals are highlights, don't you think? Uh, because I mean, you know, <laughs> day by day is pretty. Monotonous. I mean, to write about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so I had kept a journal, and it, uh, it just uh, I'd toss that journal away or what I'd written, and you know, and then just suddenly the time was right, and with my friends helping me and showing me the way. I did the writing, and <laughs> then, like I said, we proofread it hundreds of times, and it came out, and I was so <laughs> excited. <laughs> really was. <laughs> that first box, we, we even have a picture of us opening up the first box of books. <laughs> yeah. Another book you gave Girl Scouts that you're in is the Women... Um, women in Flight. Women in Flight. Can you mm -hmm. tell a little bit about going to the Smithsonian? And oh, my gosh. What a thing to be able to do. They actually, um, National Air and Space Museum is the most popular museum um, on, in, you know, in that area. They have a big area of museums. And they close that museum down for us for the night. And from 8 o'clock on, it was ours. And uh, the women that were there that were involved, you got to meet all of them, and, and they were young, and uh, then they were the elders. And it was just, what can you say, amazing, you know. You just got to visit with them about their experiences and all? Yeah. And you were invited, though, to, yeah. to the Smithsonian. Yeah. That's one of the top. Yeah, and of yeah. course, um, you know, the way things go sometimes, uh, with special diets and stuff, I didn't stay in the hotel like the rest of the people. And wouldn't you know, I was running to get there on time. And my cousins had sent me some balloons in celebration, and then dragging the balloons along, trying to get to the <laughs> NASA Air and Space Museum. It, it was, and you walk in, and you you see that first shuttle that. John Glenn was in, you know, and there it is, you know. You just can't imagine being there. <laughs> it was. We'll go there on the close-up pic. Oh. They're going to go, all three of them are going on close-up. Oh, yeah, great. Great. Be sure to go to it. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Do you have any weird questions? Not weird, I guess. Funny stories from, to, like, I guess. Did you take tourists out or, like, just? Oh yeah, That's people that you flew. Sure. Yeah. Did you? So did you get your taxi license then? Is that what it's called? Isn't that what's called? Right now? A commercial license. Commercial. Okay. Yeah. And then you have to get an instrument rating so you can read the dials. <laughs> yeah. But. Tourists? Oh, let me see. Or anybody that you flew that was like a funny story or something? Well, <laughs> you know, um, come to think of it, I was flying for um, LAB Flying Service, and um, we had a, a group of Japanese people, and they just uh, chattered away because they figured I was the baggage person. You know, I was just going to put the baggage in the airplane, and then the pilot would come. <laughs> but then when I stepped into the airplane, you had to step up on the wing and slide across, and we were all loaded up. They, it was just went 
dead quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and then I locked the door and fired it up, and away we went. And then they then they jabbered and, and had a good time. But we got to Skagway, and it was such <laughs> a difference because there was a group of tourists from Germany, and I mean, they barely waited for the door to be opened and the and the people to get out. I mean, they just stormed into the airplane. It was like, okay, we're ready to go, you know. <laughs> what a difference, you know, and people are different. It's, Did you have any problems being a female pilot early on? I mean, it was probably, you weren't, there weren't very many. No, there weren't. There were two in Southeast, but you just, you know, I don't think I, I'd like to play that, I never wanted to play that card. I just uh, worked as hard as I could. And, uh, you work twice as hard because you're trying to um, get along in that world where there's not many women flying. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes. Was there anybody that wouldn't fly with you? Oh, um... There was one woman that she was just swearing up a storm. I think it was a woman. I'm, oh, yeah. Um, blankety blank, I'm not going to fly with any blankety blank female pilot. And <laughs> then she saw I was the only choice, so she got in with me. But <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> may I? No. Chair, read. Chair. Yes. Um, my granddad was born in 1901, mm -hmm. and he is part of the OX-5 Club. Oh, uh-huh. And he is in the Prairie Aviation Hall of Fame, which my brother's the president of that museum. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, I got, he texted me a picture the other day. It was him and Jonathan Livingston. No, um, who went across the Atlantic? Uh, Charles, Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh? So my, my granddad and Charles Lindbergh, knew each other because oh my, my grandpa goodness. started airports. Did you ever meet anybody who was also like, there's so many different people that are famous in aviation, yourself being one that is, you're my hero, but did you ever bump into someone that you mm -hmm. felt like, oh my gosh, it's such a great honor to meet you in your time flying? You no. Know, uh, as far as women mm -hmm. go, I didn't. I see. Yeah. I have met um, some of the old timers, um, like some of the weans and things. Oh, right. And they that, were yeah, first yeah. generation. I was, I was really proud to be able to meet them, but I did not. Although my first boss, who was very loud and very obnoxious, and I would get <laughs> fired periodically because it was slow, and then as soon as it got busy, I'd get hired again. <laughs> but uh, he he used to call me, nickname me Amelia. Oh, awesome. Oh. Yeah. I so, thought that was nice. That is, that's, <laughs> that's you, you, you were meeting them, you were them. <laughs> hey, in Yakutat, they uh, nicknamed her Hot Flaps because uh, <laughs> after Hot Lips, which you probably don't know, it's an old TV show. So. Her, 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 plane, her plane still has a sign in there. Hot What decision do you believe has had the most impact on your life? Hmm. I think probably the decision, um, and I don't want this to sound bad, but I did not get along very well with the, my mother when I was growing up. And I think the best decision I ever made was to leave Montana and come to Alaska. I'm sure that changed everything in your life. <laughs> oh, yes, it did. It did. So in what ways have the, has the world changed since you were our age? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, where would you start? I mean, the segregation, like you were saying. In the beginning, that, that's a big one. 
Yeah. That's changed. I, I think we've taken a step but, backwards yeah. <laughs> now. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get back on, on track again. But um, the other things that have changed have just been um, what you have. I mean, you think of your cell phones and everybody knows what cell phones do. I mean, and they're all on them and, and it does leave somewhat less communication between people face to face. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge. Really yeah. Do. Well, think of like the houses we used to live in. I mean, people wouldn't live in anything like that anymore. Oh, no. no. They're super tiny. When when I was a teenager, well, our one house was so tiny it was about uh, 10 by 10. And I lived, I lived, I built a teepee in the garden, lived in a teepee. <laughs> and we never had, for most of them, we didn't, have, well, some of them we had outhouses, and we did, you know, so the houses were, I mean, yeah. the living conditions were completely it's different. Hard. Especially in the last one. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, villages, village life, like Yakutat and stuff, was totally different. Mm -hmm. Although, I still get very homesick for it. Yeah. Every, they made you feel very much like you're part of the, their family, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's a little different in Cordova, I believe. But they Did they have, call you auntie? Nope. I hear that in the in the uh, native culture a lot. They do. I, yeah. I did not. Right. No. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Missed that one. Yeah. So how does the word old make you feel? Um, I don't like old. I like elder. I'm elder. <laughs> <laughs> and elders seem to get more respect. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Words mean a lot. Oh, they do. I think elders, you think of, when you think of old, you think of somebody all crippled up. And, well, maybe I am, but <laughs> I won't admit it. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. Well, would you rather be called old or elder? Elder. Probably elder, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It has more honor to it. It does have more yeah. honor to it. She was out ice skating on the lake the other day. Kick sledding. Kick sledding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While you were skating. <laughs> so you're not old and crippled. <laughs> yeah. But boy, did I get overheated the day that I left you. I didn't realize how dress, warm my dress. Oh, I was just roasting. I looked down and got back. But it was fun. That's it was good. good. Yeah. yeah. It was good. <laughs> hey, can I... One more, and then yeah. I'll pull a quit. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> when I bought my shop, there was a John's helicopter was in it, mm -hmm. and and <laughs> did you ever get a chance to drive a helicopter, fly a helicopter? Oh, I have, yeah, a couple of hours, but you know, nothing to, um, so that I'd feel like I could go out and safely land it, maybe. Well, you know, I think you can land anything. Uh, it, just, <laughs> it just depends how hard. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The darn earth is hard. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you've spent time in a helicopter. I mean, at least flying around a little bit. Yep, yep. I used to help uh, John get his, you know, the, the rotors have to be kind of, in, what do you call it when you're, it's not tuning. But Primed or? Tracked. Tracked, yeah. And I used to go out with John and, and track that, I, and I enjoyed that a lot. Okay, two more questions. Okay. Um, so do you feel the need for a better connection between the youth of Cordova and the elder generation? And if so, what do you feel we could do to bridge the gap? Wow, I, I think there could certainly be a better connection. And I think what you're doing is a way to bridge that gap. That's a good thing. I mean, that's, that really is. Um, I know some places, um, they have uh, organizations that combine, you know, elders with the younger people to work together and to um, enjoy different uh, activities together. And I think that's a good way to do it, too. Mm -hmm. 
um, something could be started with that idea in mind. And it, it um, there, there's so much separation if you see that. And I, I think you understand very well, it seems. Well, you know very well how, how much is needed and how that connection needs to be made. What kind of an activity could you enjoy with the, would you like to enjoy with the youth? Oh, you know, I, I actually love kids. I really do. Mm -hmm. And uh, working on any kind of activity is good. You know, I mean, you could be drawing or putting a jigsaw puzzle together or... Like which playing I, games? Games. I'm thinking of having games. a game, game oh. night with them. Um, that that would be Kids great. Seniors. That would be great. Yeah. And hey. what about like with a, you know without the focus being so it's just staring at you. Yes. You know, that's yeah. what you need. Just and games playing. are very very good uh -huh. for that. What about like teaching skills to younger people? Would you be interested in doing something like that? Hmm, I don't know if I have any skills. <laughs> Take them out <laughs> <in> an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that that would be good, certainly. Uh, it, it depends on how you approach it again. If well, I can, if I can just add, she likes to inspire um, interest in aviation in young people, and does. Um, there's young people that come up to her fairly regular still and you know ask her for advice and look look for ways because the basic route to um, being a commercial pilot is very much the same as it was before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. is there are they doing the ground school class? yeah um, so we got a new teacher this year named Tommy Dahill um, and he happens to be a pilot mm -hmm. uh, he has his private he said mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he has his commercial Mm -hmm. But he is teaching a ground school class this year, mm -hmm. and I'm in that, so and, it's and good the, so far. That just the, that's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful way to start, mm -hmm. yes. That'd be something that, I don't know if you would want to talk to their class, but I think that'd be super cool. <laughs> I'm not in the well, class, but... <laughs> well, I mean, you know, when, I, there when one time, uh, so. I was going to ground school, I just, uh, it was a self-taught thing. Yeah, it really. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like, most of it is self-taught. Like, you, he's there to, like, help you and, like, explain things. But yeah. But I, a lot I of it is. work with anybody. A lot of it's, like, reading a, materials and things like, like that. It seems like a guest speaker, though, would be a really kind of a, a highlight to just inspire the Oh, I've, I've got a wonderful so picture fun. of um, Marvin and um, Maisie have a granddaughter who is just, Oh, so thrilled about flying. And I have a picture of her, and she's holding up my book. Oh, <laughs> nice. And it is so cute, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it? It's a great picture with her brother looking over her shoulder. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was very cool. And they, they've always sent me notes if they get hear anything that she's doing. And I love that, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great thing. But um, I am not a cook, so that wouldn't be something I'd be interested <laughs> in. You here. probably have a lot of survival skills because you did that survival training that we talked about. Yeah. But you probably, I read your book, and I know there's places in there that you needed to have survival skills to last. Yeah, I was going to ask. <laughs> so just finish did, that did story come about in? you being freezing cold coming back down to Juneau. And when you oh, were, yeah. That was horrible. She could barely hold on to the controls yeah. you know, coming through below yeah. zero weather right and yeah. to get down. Yeah, yeah, it was it was because I'd gotten that good clue from the the guys uh, flying the bigger planes that, you know, if you go up to six thousand feet, you know, it, it's smooth as smooth can be, but then when we got to Haynes it was just rough. And I I couldn't just go down quickly because I might have to clear the engine and go a little more and by the time I was there I was <laughs> frozen. Yeah, I the was. engine was just about ready to quit when yeah, it, was, it was also frozen but she landed it. That was 
very close call. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the old days work, huh? Yeah. 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 Were there ever any close calls then? Were, were there ever any close calls, in your opinion, compared to Anita? <laughs> Well, it all depends on what you call a close call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Well, everybody on our saner read your book this summer. It was really fun. And to see different ages doing different perceptions. Yeah. And at the end, um, one that I took away was how thrifty you were as a new pilot with your new T-craft. You know, the Taylor craft needs to be flown and you wanted to do this grand Alaska tour and my memory was twenty four dollars and fifty six cents or something yeah. of that nature. <laughs> and so I gotta applaud you there. That was pretty amazing that you were that <laughs> able to pull off a trip around Alaska for under twenty five bucks. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> one of, one of the things that from reading her book that I like to um, pass on is the difference between her as a female writing this book and me as having seen this whole thing as a guy. Because a guy's perspective, and I know it's a generalization, but would be the blood, the gore, the accidents, the crashes, the death, you know. Right. Because the reality is it was very dangerous. And most of the people she flew with are dead, you know. And that's what, but her take on the story is so much more the joy of flight and the, the gift that she was given on being able to do this and kind of glosses over the, you know, that part. That, that is an that, interesting You know, to me, that, that's, that's the part that I see. Like, the people I learned to fly with, almost everybody is dead, you know. Um, and from flying? Yeah, yeah, from crashes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's very, very dangerous and still is. Yeah. The weather in coastal Alaska has not changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you say you were safer than most? I mean, would you No, I, I don't think so. I should, I, um, no, I don't no, think she so. Took many, to but, she took more chances aspect. than any guy. Well, just to like <laughs> One of my favorite flights, Gail was going to fly me out because the hatchery was having trouble with their um, pipeline, kept breaking in Main Bay, and they lost their fish. And I had contracted with the hatchery to weld their pipe, and you were going to fly me out to Main Bay, and it was really just a normal thing, but the weather just turned really bad, and you took incredibly cautious maneuvers at different, because I didn't realize how complicated it is. At different heights, there's different visibility and requirements. And then you try different down below, and you'd poke out this way, and you'd go for a while, and then you'd poke back around and go this way. Because you were trying to succeed in your mission of getting, you know, this sack of potatoes to a welding project. <laughs> anyway, at the end of the day, I thought that was really gracious that you didn't, you know, take the, ch at least from my perspective, you were really careful with this sack of potatoes. So thank you. <laughs> did you get to the hatchery, or did you have to come home? I think we came home and we tried to get in the next day. And then a week later, you mentioned you weren't a cook, and neither am I. A week later, you flew my wife out. And she <laughs> helped the whole crew at Main Bay for that three week period. And Eli, Eli was in the plane, he was one. So it must have been 19 years ago. Oh. Because he's 20 now. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And I'm wow. 21 now. So anyway, so thank wow. you for that. It was a very <laughs> lovely flight, and, I, and we made it. I remember you picking me up from Kayak Island, and I had a pile of rocks, the round rocks, <laughs> and then I had this really big, heavy one. I thought it was, I thought it was petrified wood, and you were like, Anita, I, don't, I just don't think we can take that one. <laughs> and then at the last minute, we'd load it up. He goes, Okay, you can bring it. So I brought it. Well, it happens to be 20, 20 some million year old um, whale. Wow, petrified whale in really good shape. Wow. And um, yeah. So and it's worth ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying you're going to give me your share now. <laughs> but anyhow, that's that made it back, and and um, yeah, that's what I found out it was. Ray Troll looked at it, thought it was dinosaur. Wow. And then Alan Marquette, he 
to oh, get her so a while good. and he's figure so good. it out. Yeah. yeah, he's so really good. Good eye. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. She wasn't going to let me bring her back. <laughs> and it was the last thing that got on the plane. <laughs> she goes, oh, you can bring this. And then do you do that last little 30-second yeah, thing? Do it, do, it, do a fresh one. 